Okay, this is Fizz2320 Computing 2, and this is the fourth video in the series that's on SciPy. And in this video, we'll be looking at curve fitting in Python. So, just as a roundup of the previous SciPy videos, um, we've been looking at using SciPy Optimize module and the fmin and fsol functions there um, to find minima, minima and also roots in continuous functions. So where you have a function that defines a value over all ranges of x. Uh, we also used uh, SciPy interpolate module um, to either interpolate between data points or to fit splines to uh, more noisy data. So if you like, if you have a, a set of data points you've measured, then interpolation or spline fitting allows you to create a continuous function that describes that data in some way. Uh, and in the previous video, we were using uh, SciPy Integrate um, for integrating data um, and SciPy MISC derivative for differentiating um, uh, functions of data. So in this video, we're going to, going to talk about fitting um, functions to data. So the point here is that interpolation is all very well, but actually it doesn't describe in itself any of the real underlying physics. And of course, the point of doing physics is to um, understand um, how the what's controlling the data, how it's related to each other, um, and to what's going on as the underlying physical processes. So really what we're looking to go and do is come up with some mathematical model to describe um, data that we've measured and then fit that to that data and from that extract parameters um, and of course also estimate errors or uncertainties um, in those fitted uh, parameters. So this is all done in SciPy with the, um, in, within the Optimize module. Um, so there's got a whole bunch of uh, useful tools for um, fitting functions to data, but actually the simplest and probably the easiest to use is the curve fit function from that module. So the sort of thing we're interested in doing here is, is having a set of data points and we want to go and write some sort of arbitrary function and use that to um, fit to our data and then from that use the parameters in that arbitrary function as things we're trying to get out. So just as a kind of example, um, kind of lots of places in physics you end up with, with exponential decays going on. So um, for example if you have a, an atom and you're excited into a higher energy state, um, then in the absence of having any um, stimulated um, emission, um, so in the, in the absence of any kind of laser processes, then that atom will decay back to its ground state um, with a certain probability that it'll decay within a certain time constant. Um, and in the process of doing that, it might, for example, emit a photon um, of the corresponding energy. So if you measure the um, intensity of photons coming out of the atom at that particular uh, transition energy, then what you would observe is an exponential decay in the intensity as atoms successfully de energized from the high energy state back into the ground state. So what you would then want to go and do, for example, is to go and take that data and fit an exponential decay to it. So this is where SciPy curve fit comes in because it makes it very, very easy to fit um, an exponential data. But in fact, it's better than that because it won't only just fit um, an exponential data, it'll fit any function you give it at all, whatever, however complicated you want to make that. So what it's actually doing underneath is a nonlinear least squares fit. So um, what it's essentially doing is it's trying to minimize the difference between um, a function that describes the data and the individual data points. And when it's least squares, it's actually minimizing the square of the distance. So it calculates the um, vertical distance between a data point and a point on this function, um, takes the square of it, sums all of those up, and then says that's the thing that it's trying to find the minimum value of. So it then adjusts these parameters in our fitting function to try and get the best, the line that best describes the set of data there. Okay, so um, it can also handle um, data where you've got error bars on um, the points on the y-axis, and in fact can handle data where the error bars are of a different size for each data point. So in other words, if you have a data point with a large error bar, then that means you shouldn't try so hard to make the line go through that data point compared to a data point where the error bar is very small, where you're saying, no, really our fit should go, should go very close to that data point. So it'll attempt to try and fit any function of any complexity that you give it. Um, 
there are some practical limits on that. Um, of course, if you have a function with four unknowns, you have to have at least four data points in order to go and, well, five data points in order to go and fit that. Um, otherwise, you have um, too many unknowns to go and fit. But more realistically, the more unknowns you have in your function, the more likely it is, is to go and find something that fits well, but is not physically meaningful. Um, so it will also return um, a thing called the variance covariance matrix, which is useful for getting the errors on the uh, fitted parameters. And we'll come back to that in a, in a couple of slides time. And the other thing to be aware of with curve fit, at least on the version of curve fit that's installed on the cluster machines, is that the fitting parameters are unconstrained. So in other words, Curfit doesn't know anything at all about the physics of the model that you're trying to describe with your function that you're giving it. So it'll quite happily make all the parameters go to completely unphysical values. And although in the most recent versions of SciPy you can put limits on those values, um, in older versions of SciPy, such as the one that's installed on the cluster machines, you can't. It simply will let the parameters vary to any value at all, even if it's completely meaningless when you understand the physics of what you're trying to describe. So there are some important provisos there. You can't actually go for too complicated a function, and you have to be aware that the parameters might not necessarily be physical. So you have to do a certain amount of checking to make sure that things really make sense. So this is the, the basic signature of curve fit. Um, so it returns two things, or strictly speaking, it returns a tuple with two things in it. So it returns the parameters of the function um, that are used to that are used to fit the data, and it returns this variance covariance matrix. And then you call it's a bit like uh, fmin and fsolve. You call it passing in the name of a function, um, just as a as a Python identifier. So you're actually passing it the function, not um, a string which would be the name of the function and not a call to the function, you're passing in the actual function itself. Um, and you pass it in some x data and some y data. And then there's some optional parameters. Um, and the useful ones are this p0 keyword parameter, which is an initial guess. So just like fmin and fsolve in uh, video one in the SciPy series, um, you have to give it some place to go and start. Um, and so p0 is a list of initial guess values for all the parameters in your data set. And then the other thing you can pass it is the sigma keyword, um, which are the relative error bars on all the data points. Um, and again, we'll show that in an example a bit later on. So the, the function that you're passing it um, is basically just a standard Python function. It could be any function that you've written, but there are a certain number of rules about it. So the first thing is that the first parameter that you pass in has to be the independent, um, so in other words, the x variable, uh, as an array. Uh, the other parameters that you have in your function are fitting parameters that the curve fit function will try to adjust. Um, and then your function needs to return an array of y values. And it's important to realize that you have to it has to work with an array of x and it has to return an array of y. However, that's not so bad because in many cases, if you use the numpy maths functions, they're already automatically going to work with arrays of um, uh, numbers. So in fact, you can just write something in terms of the numpy maths functions that looks just like a, an expression for a scalar, for a single number. But because it's using the numpy functions, it'll do everything with a whole array of data all in one go. And so it's, it's just fine. Um, but other cases, you may need to go and manually make sure that you're, you're writing a loop that goes around all the data points that's been given and generates an equal number of uh, y values of results out of the function. And then what you get back, as I said, was a, first of all, the numpy array of the parameters. Um, and this is the best fit parameters to the um, set of data you've given it. And those parameters are returned in the order that they appear in your fitting function definition. So if your fitting function has uh, three parameters uh, to control the fitting, so say A, B, and C, um, then your uh, fitting function would be something like def uh, func brackets, then x, comma, A, comma, B, comma, C. And what you get out of curve fit then would be an array of three parameters which corresponds to a, b, and c, because you defined them in the function as a, b, and c. 
And again, it's important to stress, Kerfit knows nothing about the what your function is actually doing, what the physics of your function is trying to describe. All it sees is that it has something that it can call, passing in a bunch of x values, it has a certain number of other parameters that it can twiddle as it sees best, and what it gets back is a set of y values, and it has to try and make the set of y values that it gets back from your function as close as possible to being equal to the set of y data that you called it with in Curfet. And it does that by trying to adjust the, the fitting parameters to go and do that. As I say, the other thing it returns is this 2D array of this variance covariance matrix. So and this is an array that gives you the, as its name suggests, the variance and covariance um, to the fitting parameters. So just to go through that in a bit more detail. So again, if we have three parameters, A, B, and C, then what you get out of the variance covariance matrix is a three by three matrix. Um, and along the diagonal, you have the elements which are the variance. So the variance basically describes how much spread you can get in the possible values of the fitting parameter. Um, and the important thing here is that the square root of the variance is the standard error. So if I take the square root of the elements along the diagonal, I get the standard error in the best fit value of A, B and C. And that clearly is the useful thing we want. The covariance tells you about whether A and B or A and C um, and so on are linked together. So if I change the value of A, does it also change the value of B um, in the fit? Um, so ideally, if you had a model where A, B and C were three independent parameters, then changing the value of A shouldn't make necessarily make a difference to the values of B and C in a systematic way. And so what you would expect to see is that the covariance terms were all rather small. If you see a big number in the covariance terms, then that indicates that, that these parameters are not actually independent of each other, that there's some sort of level of connection in the way that the model fits the data. Um, and that then maybe tells you that um, an uncertainty you measure in A is also coupled to the uncertainty you measure in B. So if you go back if you um, to um, the sort of error handling in uh, lab one and two, um, then you remember that in order to go and do the sort of calculation to estimate the total error, you always assume that your, your variables are independent of each other. And if they have a covariance that's not small, then that means they're not independent of each other. So there's possibly something a bit funny with your model. OK, um, so that's what that actually all means. For our purposes, what we're interested in is taking the diagonal and then taking the square root of that. And that will be the thing that will give us the errors in the fitting parameters. OK, so just before we have a look at some code, I'll just show you the um, documentation page um, for CurveFit. So this is, in fact, the documentation page for, page for the current version of CurveFit. So there's a few additional parameters that have been added um, in the last couple of versions. Um, but the important ones are all there. So the first thing you have is your function, um, which is the model function you're using to describe the thing you're trying to fit. You then have the x data and the y data the p0 guess, the sigma, which is the error bars, and then the absolute sigma, and that's another parameter which we'll come to. Those are the main ones that you end up having to play with, um, but you see there's other parameters there as well. And what it returns um, is the optimal parameters, p-opt, and the covariance matrix, which it calls p-cov, which we were just talking about. Um, and there are a couple of things it might go and return, um, if any of your data has not a numbers in it, then CurveFit will throw a value error at you. It'll give up. Um, if the um, CurveFit can't manage to minimise your, to, to, sorry, if it can't manage to fit your data um, within a certain number of um, limits, then it will raise a runtime error. So, in other words, if you're, there's something wrong with your model, it's just not going to fit the data, and it doesn't matter what you go and do to the parameters, it's never going to fit them, fit the data, then eventually CurveFit will give up and it'll throw a runtime error at you. And then the other thing is if the covariance matrices are difficult to estimate, um, then it'll throw an optimised warning. Um, and again, that normally means there's gone something on slightly funny with your fitting. Um, it often means in these cases that uh, your P0 values were 
um, not good, or you hadn't provided p0 values and you really needed to provide p0 values. So if you get errors, typically it means your p0s are, are way out. Okay, so let's have a look at some code then. So we're going to start off with um, the same set of data that we were looking at in the last two videos. Um, so this is a set of data points um, that describes a sort of wiggly function. Um, and I'm going to add some noise to that data to make it a bit more interesting for curve fit to fit. And in fact, I'm going to add noise that gets bigger um, as we move across the plot. So I'm going to get this noise sketch term here. This is the scale of the noise. And that's just going to grow from 0.1 to 0.5 uh, linearly as we move across the x-axis. So that's what that term there is doing. So we get x is the is actually the second column in our data file. Y is the third column in the data file, and we're going to add to it um, some random noise, which is using a normal distribution, so a Gaussian distribution, with a scale that is given by this noise scale term. So it's going to grow from 0.1 to 0.5, and just as confirming in the size is basically the same as the length of the data. Um, and then just for convenience, I've just called sigma equal to noise. That's the error bar. So sigma is going to be the error bars on our data. So first of all, what we're going to do is just go and plot that data, just to show you what it looks like. So I'm going to use the error bar plotting function. Um, this is covered in matplotlib video 2. Um, uh, but here I'm just using it to plot some error bars. I'm going to give it a label. I'm going to show the data points in red circles. So let's just go and run that. And it's popped the figure up in the background. So there we go. So there you can see it's got the same sort of wiggly form to it. Um, and you can see the error bars are gradually getting bigger as we go from the left to the right. OK, so now we're going to try and fit um, to that data and work out what function that um, describes it. Now, this is where, of course, you need to know what is the correct function to fit. Um, well, as it turns out, this data set, I know because I generated it, um, is formed from the, si from the sum of a sine wave and a cosine wave with different amplitudes and different frequencies. So in my fitting function, I've got a sine wave with a certain amplitude and a certain frequency, and a cosine wave with a certain amplitude and a certain frequency. So altogether, I've got four fitting parameters. So I'm going to start off by writing a function that's going to describe that data. So for sake of an argument, I'm going to call it model. So the first parameter on model has to be a bunch of x values. And then I need my four fitting function, fitting parameters. And I'm just going to call them a, b, c, and d. And let's give it a doc string. Might as well just give it the formula here, even. Oops. Type straight. There we go. Okay, so doc string, and then we can actually go and do the sum. So we want a times mp sine b times x plus c times np cos d times x. OK, so it's not exactly a complicated function. OK, so now we can go off and we can actually go and just run the, the curve fit on this. So the variables x and y hold our x and y data points. Model is our function. Um, we'll start off just doing the bare fit on its own and see how we get on. So curve fit returns the optimal parameters in the covariance matrix. I should say I've imported curve fit from up the top here as well. So model is our f, x, y, and we'll stop just at that for the moment and see how we get on. 
Okay, so we want to get the errors in our um, from, from our covariance matrix. So I'll go and call that p error. And to do that, I want the square root of the diagonal of the covariance matrix. So I'm using the numpy diag function, which um, so you just put documentation up here. It simply just gets you the diagonal elements from a two-dimensional matrix, um, from a two-dimensional array. And I'm just feeding those into square root. So that's going to give me the standard errors. OK, so then, well, we might want to print the values. So let's go and do that um, first. So I'm making use of a zip in the for loop here to go and join together all of the um, bits I need to get together. Notice that a string you can iterate over and it'll give me one letter at a time. Um, and the p opt and the p error I've got uh, have their elements in the same order a, b, c, d because I defined them in the order a, b, c, d in the function here. Okay, that should do the trick there. And we could also um, plot out the data on top of our plot just so we can see what it looks like. So um, let's create a variable x fit. And I want that to take the same range as the x data. But I want to have, have a lot of data points. We'll give it 5001 data points. And now what I want to go and plot then um, is the x fit value and we need to create some y fit values. So we can do that by essentially calling our model function with the best fit parameters for a, b, c and d and our x fit data. Now what you could do would be to write something that went a bit like this to get at those values. And that works fine, but it's a bit clunky because you have to go into all of that writing out those values. So in fact, a much more elegant way of doing that is simply to do it like that. So this is the syntax I covered, I think, in functions uh, three, where I was talking about variable arguments. Um, if I have something I can iterate over, like a list or an array or a tuple, if I pass star that name as when I'm calling the function, basically it just unpacks all the elements of that list and uses them as additional positional arguments. Um, so that will, because popt is four elements long and they're defined in the same order that the function was defined, I know that is now going to give me those extra four parameters. Um, and the beauty with that is that the only thing I need to go and do is just change the way I define my function to add or remove um, parameters from it. Um, and maybe I'll show you how to do that in just a second. OK, so now we can just plot x fit, y fit, and let's fit that with a blue line. OK, and I can't spell model. There we go. That's now got rid of all of... Yep, that looks all good. OK, so let's give this a run. Just check my figure's not open. No, OK, let's run this then. And there we go. Um, whoops. A typo there, which gave me a, an error, although it actually worked. Um, let's just run that again. There we go. So what you can see here is it's given you, on the printout, it's giving you some idea of what A, B, C and D were. So 0.97 plus or minus 0.04. Um, now, OK, this is a very important point. 
The computer quite happily will tell me that I have an uncertainty of 0.04065673386167 and in fact it would go on for a bit longer given half a chance. You should know as physicists that errors, unless you know otherwise, should only be quoted to one significant figure. So therefore you should look at that and go no, that's 0.04. And you should also know that you quote the answer to the same number of decimal places as the uncertainty. So having quoted it to 0.04, you would say that was 0.97 plus or minus 0.04. Just because the computer has given you everything to a crazy number of decimal places does not mean you quote it to a crazy number of decimal places. Um, so in this module, um, in the coursework, you're going to do some fitting tasks and I'm going to ask you to go and report the values from your fitting. When you report the values of your fitting, um, and you do this in a little Word document along with some graphs, I will want you to go and quote things properly. I don't care if you don't get the computer to go and do the quoting properly. It's actually quite a hard job to get a computer to do the rounding correctly. Um, it's a non-trivial bit of code to do that. Um, but when you actually write it out in a report, it should be quoted correctly. Um, the reason I say this is because I'm also in charge of the third year advanced lab for the MFIS courses and I am sick and tired of having third year students quote numbers wrongly in their lab experiments. So I'm now on a mission to get everyone to do it right. Okay, rant over. Um, so you can see it's okay-ish, um, but it, it's sort of struggling a bit um, on the fitting here. So. Um, it, it, it sort of yeah it doesn't it, it, what it's actually doing is it, it's it's giving equal attention down at the low end where all the error bars are small as it is up at the high end when the error bars are big but the error bars are big here that means it shouldn't be trying as hard to fit the data so we need to put the error bars into the model so let's go and do that now so we're going to close that down and we're going to go back to our code and we have um, up here we have sigma equals noise. This is the error bars. Sigma is the error bar. So if I just do that, you get a whole bunch of error bars. In fact, maybe it's easier if I show you in the variable explorer. So there's our error bar, starting at 0 0.1 and going up to 0 0.5. So let's add those into our curve fit. So all we have to do is add in the curve fit The keyword parameter is equal to the variable called sigma. Um, I could actually equally easily, I could equally easily just call that noise. I don't even need that line there. Okay, so I'm going to pass it um, in the keyword parameter sigma. I'm going to pass it the size of those error bars. So we'll keep those there, and we'll go and see what that does to the fit. So let's run that again. Okay. So now if we compare the answers we got each time we ran that. So on the top here is the answers we got without looking at the error bars. And here are the answers we got with the error bars. And what we should notice is that the size of the uncertainty has dropped a bit. Um, yes, no, it's dropped, I think, on all the, all the parameters. It's dropped a little bit. So we're actually fitting more accurately our data. Um, you see the actual numbers it's returned have also changed around a bit. We're now at 1.015 um, rather than 0 0.97. Well, partly that's just simply because the noise changes every time. So you're going to get different values even if we run the same code over and over again, just because the random numbers are slightly different. Um, and um, what you're going to get then is um, an idea of what those values are. If we look at the plot we generated, um, especially if we zoom in a bit, then we may see some cases like here where the line has not gone through the error bar and here and here and there. And you might think, well, hang on, isn't this a problem? Shouldn't the error bar go through, shouldn't the line go through all the error bars? And the answer is no, it shouldn't. So the thing you want to remember is this error bar represents um, the standard error. So that's essentially saying that the, the line um, has a about 66% chance of going through that line because that line represents the standard deviation um, away from that data point. And if the errors are distributed normally, 
which we know they are because I used a Gaussian distribution function, then the um, true values um, have only a 66% chance of lying within the error bar. So what we should find, if it's all gone right, is that two thirds of the error bars have the line going through them. The line goes through two thirds of the error bars and misses about one third. So if you see your line going through all the error bars, then it tells you you've probably got something funny with your data. Um, real data only goes through two thirds of the error bars. Um, you should then be something like 90 something percent a chance within, you're within two error bars and 99.99% chance that you're within three error bars. So you'll be relieved to know that when I assess whether or not you've got the right answer, um, I look at uh, what the reasonable error bar is, and so long as you're within three error bars of the right answer, I say that's good enough. Um, and that way I know there's a 99.99% chance that, um, that you are right and, and where it's all fine. Um, since there are only 100 students, that's a quite good chance that no one's going to get um, uh, marked wrongly when they should have been marked right. OK, so that's now using the error bars. There is one um, slight problem with that. Um, if I quickly generate a set of data, um, so let's have um, y2 equals 0 0.5 times x plus 0 0.3. Now let's make a new figure and plot that data up. So if I do plot.error bar, x, y, y error equals noise, um, and um, let's have a look. We want that cap parameter. So cap size equals 3, and format equals red circles. Whoops, since I plotted the wrong data, of course, I should have plotted y2. Let's try again, plotting y2. Right, OK, so there you go. So you see, that is data that falls on a straight line. So now what we're going to do is going to ask CurveFit to go and fit that. Um, so p opt p curve equals CurveFit. So now I'm going to make use of a lambda function. This is something I covered in uh, functions five, I think. So all I'm doing is just defining a straight line, n, x, n times x plus c, x, y, sigma equals noise. OK. And now let's go and calculate the standard error. So it's the same thing again, just taking the square root of the diagonal of the um, covariance matrix. And now let's just print p opt p error. Okay, so. What it's done is it's 0 0.104 plus or minus 0 0.03 and it's um, given us minus 0 0.01. Um, that's interesting. Uh, with quite a large uncertainty on it. Um, so it's had some trouble fitting that. Let's go and give it a P0 and just see if we get a slightly better fit there. So here I'm using initial parameters, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. Whoops. Let's go to the print again. Um, no, OK, it really wants to go and make that data. Um, oh. Of course, I've done the same thing again. My apologies, I've curve fitted the wrong set of Y data. So just to prove that even your lecturers can go and make silly mistakes sometimes. So let's convert the standard error again and print it. 
Right, okay, that's more like it. It's coming up saying 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and basically the standard error is 0 on both. Okay, so that's fine. After all, that's the values I put in. And of course, there's no noise, so maybe you wouldn't expect any error. But if you actually looked at this data, then yeah, sure, you'd say, okay, maybe I can draw a straight line through all of that. But you could also draw a straight line that went through all the error bars, either up or down. So just because you could draw a straight line through the middle of it and they're all perfectly lined up, isn't really telling you what the actual uncertainty in the gradient is, because you could make that, you could draw a straight line equally easily that went through all the bottoms of the error bars or all the top of the error bars. And how are you to know that that's one's better than the other? So as a physicist, you look at that and say, well, actually, that uncertainty, which tells me I have an uncertainty of precisely zero in the gradient, is wrong. The error bars are too big. Um, there is some uncertainty in the error bars. So the solution to this is to make use of the absolute sigma keyword. So in our curve fit here, if I set this value absolute sigma equals true, what I'm doing is I'm telling the curve fit program that these error bars I've given it are not the relative importance of all the data points, but they're the actual uncertainty, they're the actual error bar in the data. And so that should be taken into account when it's calculating the uncertainties. So the difference is, is that without that absolute sigma equals true, what curve fit says is, ah, I see that the error, error value goes from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. That means that the um, points on the left-hand side are five times more important than the points on the right-hand side. But it doesn't say anything about the actual size of that uncertainty. It's just the relative size. By setting that absolute sigma equals to true, I'm saying, no, actually, these, in, these real error bars are really our error bars. So if we run that now, and then if I go and calculate the error, and then if I print it out again, then what you can see is it still converged to the same numbers, 0 0.5 and 0 0.3. But now, particularly on the, um, the intercept term, but actually also on the gradient term, it's now made that uncertainty bigger. So these come up with bigger uncertainties, and that reflects the fact that you really could draw a line with some through the error bars with slightly different gradients. So in physics problems, you probably normally want to have your absolute sigma equals true. Um, so we're going to add absolute sigma equals true to our program here, and we'll calculate things correctly. Okay, so again, we can just run that now. If I run that, and you'll see it's still coming up with similar numbers as before, um, but the error bars are now slightly bigger. Um, and of course, it's overlaid the plots on top of each other, which doesn't help us. Um, let's run that again. So there we go. There's the plot, data points, and the wiggly line underneath it. Okay. Um, so what else can we do? Well, we can add an extra parameter to this. Let's just add another parameter, which is going to be a constant offset. And let's see how we get on with that. Now, because of the way I'm calling this function, I don't need to do anything else. Everything else is going to adjust automatically because of the fact that I have extra unknowns apart from the print, which I need to do that for. OK, so if I run this, So now we can say, um, if we compare the uh, errors, you see the errors are starting to creep up a little bit here. Um, they're a little bit bigger. Fit still sort of more or less working. Um, and it's managed to find a, a zero offset. Um, we could always add um, extra parameters to this. And eventually, it's going to decide it gets going to struggle to go and find a good fit. The other thing you could do is you can give it the initial starting values. Um, by default, curve fit is going to assume your starting values are all ones. Um, so in this case, you can see that's actually pretty good because all those values are pretty close to one already. Um, so that's um, that's a pretty good start. Let's go and show the problem. If I just go and change the um, scale of the data, so let's try. Um, changing this data, so y is y times 
um, a million and that should be times equals not equals times times equals a million so that I just point out there's a Python operator that says y it basically reads it as y equals y times 1 e to the six, 1 million it just does it all in one go it's what's called an in place operator so now I'm going to fit the data um, and um, it looks like it's starting to struggle a bit to go and fit things. Let's run that again. Um, and it's managed to find some numbers, but it's starting to have problems um, as to what it's actually doing with this. This is because I've made the initial starting guesses get very, very big. So in particular, what you can see is it's it somehow managed to fit this with a very, very fast oscillating function. So it's clearly not actually working very well. As I said, that's because the um, starting parameters um, are too far away from one to let it fit easily. So because I've just multiplied everything up by a million, I need to also compensate that by giving it bigger starting values, or at least starting values are a better estimate. So again, if you look at these numbers here, OK, the A is coming out um, with a large number, but the B has gone to a small negative number. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, it's gone to a negative number, the large negative number, even a very high frequency. Again, the C is big, um, and the D has gone to a um, again a rather large number, um, and the E is also a relatively large number. Um, so it's now starting. You can see it's starting to struggle. So let's try giving it some better guesses to start with. So by multiplying it by a million, basically in effect what I've done is I've multiplied A and C up by a million, but B and D shouldn't have changed very much. So what I can do is I can go back to my fitting and I can give it P0, whoops, P0 equals, so let's give it a million and one point zero and a million and one point zero and zero point zero so actually I know that e is is zero in this data but um, I now by multiplying the the amplitude by a million um, I need to also say that the starting values need to be up near a million as well so let's go and see how it does with this and there you go um, it's managed to go and fit the data reasonably nicely um, so it's returned again and again if you look at these sides here that's close to a million close to a half close to a mil million one and a half um, close to zero on the scale of things being a million and again looking at the uncertainties it's not completely fitted but um, within the uncertainties in the model it's not bad so that's a good demonstration that um, if your fitting parameters are not close to one you're going to have to give it initial starting guesses which are more nearly like the right thing and one of the big challenges in using curve fit is to work out how to give it a good guess so particularly you may end up working with models in physics that um, you have to get quite a good guess in order to, to go and fit the data um, well or efficiently and so a lot of the challenge is actually in writing some way of taking some data and estimating what the fitting parameters is going to be in order to let curve fit go and do the final stage and actually get you there and get you a reasonable uncertainty. Okay, so why might curve fit fail? Um, so we're just talking about this. Um, parameters are not close to one, um, so you have to give a better guess as the starting point, and that's this P0 keyword. Bad data points. Um, so um, if you um, have um, one kind of outlier data point that you know is bad, you just have to get rid of it. Um, if you know that there's just a lot of scatter, then make use of the sigma keyword to go and set the um, scale of the individual error bars. Um, too many parameters in your model. Um, so curve fit is not magic. Um, if your model has too many uh, parameters in it, um, then it curve fit will go and get stuck uh, trying to minimize things in a, in a crazy place, particularly if your starting guess is not good. 
So your options are either to give it a very good starting guess or to try and make the model simpler. Um, you can't just expect it to magically get all the way there with a massively complicated model. You have to do some of the work yourself. Um, and then the other problem are that the parameters are not independent. And this shows up as large covariances. Um, so then it's difficult to go and make um, sensible unique values for each one. So for example, what it means is that um, you can get an equally good fit by um, adjusting one parameter one way and another parameter which is correlated either in the same way or a different way. So you get these, um, the, these relationships between the parameters and you then um, can't find a single unique combination of data points. Um, and then the other problem uh, is that your parameters are simply not physical. So again, curve fit will let your parameters vary to any value you like, um, unless you put in bounds in the, using the latest version of SciPy. Um, if you have problems with the values disappearing off to unphysical values, then you need to do a bounded fitting. So either using curve fit or there are other packages out there that can do a good job. Uh, it should be the case that for everything you're doing in Computing 2, um, you can simply do it by finding a good starting point and it'll, it'll converge um, correctly. You shouldn't need to have problems with having um, unbounded parameters in Computing 2. But if you're using these techniques and you're fitting data from your project or from Advanced Lab next year um, or in a job, then it's entirely possible that you're going to find situations in which you need to think about bounded fitting. Okay, so that's all there is for um, this video. Um, 